Oh, I was trying to get you to stay. <laughs> no, he can't, he can't do it. He's got to go. That one little accident many years ago, leading these kids astray. So, uh, you tried to hide it from me all, all week. And I realized today that you actually do have a son. That big orange thing in the sky, it actually does come out here. And uh, I've seen it now, and I actually saw the moon as well tonight. So, uh, so yeah, I mean, if it's my fault that you had snow, I mean, and come back at Christmas time and give you guys a white Christmas someday. So, um, I, again, I was telling Pastor, I appreciate so much uh, the hospitality of, uh, of, of you all. And uh, I know that... Um, uh, you guys, it's, this is what the church does. Uh, they minister in this way. Um, it's really cool to be able to, to go around and, and be in, a, in, a, in an assembly like this, uh, knowing that uh, you know, there might not be a lot of things necessarily we have in common um, uh, from a personal standpoint. We do in some ways, obviously, but uh, there might be interests that you have that I don't have or, or, and vice versa and, and different things like that. But there's always something that brings us together. And that is that bond that comes only from Christ. And I've experienced that this week. And I just want to say thank you. Uh, as, uh, as we finish up tonight, I fly back home tomorrow. And uh, I just want to say thank you so much for welcoming me and uh, uh, making me, I feel, I feel a part of, of what you guys are doing here. And, it's, and that really is because of uh, uh, the bond that we have because of Jesus Christ. I'm th- very thankful tonight. Um, uh, we're going to try to make this as practical as possible tonight. And I might come down. Is it okay if I walk down there? Will the microphone be okay if I, if I go down? <laughs> You're like, you know. <laughs> maybe, maybe not. We'll see. Um, uh, but I might, I might he gave me, she gave me the thumbs up, so I got the thumbs up, so uh, I might be able to do that tonight. We might interact a little bit more tonight because I might ask a few questions as well. Um, uh, the, the, what we're going to be dealing with tonight in this tree model, um, it, it, it really, again, there are other m- models out there for counseling. This is the one that we find uh, helpful. Uh, we do feel like it's, it's uh, the, the picture is, is centered in Scripture. I do want to warn us again um, that it's a very, it's a kind of a, a semi-dangerous thing to, to to take an analogy or an illustration too far. Uh, and that can be done with this because uh, if we're thinking, okay, biblical change, if that's, a, if that's, a, if that's a really a Bible thing and we, uh, the tree is really a, a model that we can use from the Bible, how can we really, really spiritualize the whole thing and make it totally fit? What does the bark mean in context with scripture? Or, you know, that would be taking the, 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 the illustration uh, too far, It'd be a dangerous thing. So I just want to warn us uh, not to take it farther than, uh, than really the intent. Uh, and I think the intent is simple, um, but I think the picture is a really good one. And uh, we can take this, and hopefully you're able to bring these, these books back out. I wonder if, uh, if there's, are there any more out there, just in case somebody didn't, does anybody need one? Everybody, everybody have what they need? If you, if you need one, I think they can, they can bring you bring you. There's a couple left out there. I'm going to walk through this. Uh, I gotta, we're going to talk a couple things here uh, as far as what this, the tree model is, but um, I'm going to kind of walk through it and just, and just say, hey, this is how we use it. Um, you might have something else that you do as far as when you counsel somebody else. Wonderful. If you're giving the truth of God with the love of God, lives will be changed for the glory of God. Okay. I just think this might be a helpful thing to, uh, to be able to utilize. Um, uh, this evening. Well, let's pray once again and ask God to, uh, to govern our time here uh, this evening. Father, we thank you again for giving us this opportunity. Lord, I pray that uh, there would be clarity as uh, this could be confusing sometimes, and I pray that you would not allow me to confuse anything. Um, I pray that you would help us to uh, see it clearly this evening uh, and help it to be helpful, Lord. And I pray, I, I, I I pray, as, as Pastor just mentioned just a little bit ago, that, that we would completely rely on, on your spirit to, uh, to do the change. And we know that we are just conduit uh, for, to help. Lord, we know you desire to use us. Um, we thank you for that. 
but uh, in reality, it's the Word of God and it's the Holy Spirit that does the change. And we know that. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to be, to be clear in that and understanding. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, as we look tonight at uh, this tree model, I think it's important for us to understand kind of where, where we got it from. I don't, I don't want you to think we just pulled it out of, the, out of the blue. It was like, oh, the tree, that would be a good thing to try to counsel people with. Uh, no, it, it is grounded. There, the picture is grounded in Scripture. And, the, and, and what we see in Scripture is a simple truth. Uh, and we see this a, a number of places in, in the Bible. A couple that we kind of want to just talk about tonight. Psalm 1, verse 3. Just uh, turn there real quick. Um, we're going to go to just a couple quick places as we talk about what the tree, how, how the tree model is, is illustrated in Scripture. Uh, of course, Psalm 1, we see again, it's, it's, it's blessed, uh, happy, content in life uh, is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. So happy is the guy that doesn't do these things, but this is the man who will be content and blessed and happy in his ways. And remember, we talked about satisfaction yesterday. Um, happiness not, should not be what we aim for. And in our counsel with others, we shouldn't try to, to motivate them to look for happiness. That's, that's not the idea contentment in Christ, satisfaction in God is the, is the goal. Now, again, it, it, we need to be careful here because it can look a little hedonistic, like I need to be satisfied in life. That's not necessarily the intent. The intent is to say only God satisfies. Only God satisfies. And as we, as, we, as we translate that to the people that we are counseling, we need to help them understand why that is the case. And the Holy Spirit will do that through his word. But again, going back to Psalm chapter one, it says, but verse two, but his delight is in the law of the Lord and in his law doth he meditate day and night. Of course, we talked about that principle last night. The person that is doing this, meditating on the scripture day and night, and that, that's just, a, that's just a, a, an idea that, that, that this needs to be something that's, that's very frequent in our lives, meditating. It's constantly there. We're constantly thinking Bible, constantly thinking scripture. What is he like? Well, verse three, he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Uh, it's, this, is a, this is a fascinating study, just even going through this, this verse right here. The person that plants themselves by living water, you've probably seen this before, uh, flying out west, uh, if you fly during the day and you look out, out a window, you can see this picture pretty, pretty easily because obviously there's a lot of parched areas, uh, desert areas around here, but you look down and you see these, these green green uh, rows uh, down on, on, on the earth. And you know what these green rows are. They're, they're trees. And the only reason they're green right there is because you know right in the middle of that green row is some kind of a river, some kind of a, a body of water. And uh, the reason they are green is because they are planted by rivers of living water. And they're constantly drawing in that, 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 that refreshness and that's exactly the picture that we see for us as believers. We will be like a tree planted when we are planted by the rivers of water. Uh, it bringeth forth his fruit in his season. Uh, and, and basically the, the, the fascinating thing to that is when we need that fruit, it will be there if we stay in the scriptures. You know, if there is a season of my life that I might be going through a certain trial and I'm, 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 it's hard for me to, to look past the problems of life and look to the promises of God, if I'm planted by living streams of living water in that season, I will have the fruit that I need that comes forth. Again, it's a supernatural thing. So it bringeth forth his fruit in his, his season. His leaves shall not wither. It'll be constantly a constant flow. Uh, into, the, into our lives. His leaves shall not wither and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Again, that prospering doesn't mean you're gonna have, you know, you're, you're gonna make all the money in the world. It means that you will do those things that God wants you to do. You will prosper in the things that God intends for you to, to prosper in. And that means things that bring him glory. And that only happens when we are planted by streams of living water. Another illustration of, of the tree in Jeremiah chapter 17 
This one is a little more, it, 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 they think that they actually, either Psalms is dependent on Jeremiah 17 or Jeremiah 17 could be dependent on, on Psalm 1. But either way, um, Jeremiah is a little more detail uh, as far as uh, the look that we see here uh, from this, the picture of this tree. Um, starting in verse 5, he says this, Thus saith the Lord, I'm sorry, Thus saith the Lord, this is uh, Jeremiah 17, verse 5, Thus saith the Lord, Cursed be the man that trusteth in man. Uh, that guy is cursed. He's not blessed. And this guy, cursed is the man that trusteth in man and maketh flesh his arm and whose heart departeth from the Lord. Of course, right there in that verse, we're seeing a satisfaction issue because that guy right there is trusting in the things of earth to give him what he thinks he needs. And the guy that does this, the, the person that does this, the, 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 he's cursed. He trusted in man and maketh flesh his arm. What's the, what's the picture there? For he shall be like a heath in the desert, shall not see when good cometh, but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness in a salt land and not inhabited. That's not a comfortable place to be. And why is this the case? It's because he's trusting in, in man. He's putting, he's putting the, the arm of man as his strength. However, verse 7, blessed is the man that trusts in the Lord and whose hope the Lord is. What is he going to be like? For he shall be as a tree planted by the waters and that spreadeth out her roots by the river and shall not see when he cometh. But her leaves shall be green and shall not be careful in the year of drought, neither shall cease from yielding fruit. Somebody who is, uh, in this picture, a tree that is planted by water, it doesn't even know that there's heat. That's what he's saying. Shall not even recognize heat when it comes. And somebody in this picture who is planted by rivers of water, when a trial comes, they are so ingrained with the truth from the word of God that in reality, it's a natural thing for them to trust God. A number of years ago, um, Matt Herbster, uh, who was our director at the Wilds at the time, his wife went to be with the Lord. Uh, she had colon cancer. And uh, he had found out in May and, and uh, uh, I had come back. He had found out while I was on a, I was on a vacation. I came back from vacation and I saw his car driving down the road by my house. So I ran out to the car. I just wanted to talk to him and give him a hug. And, and uh, I ran down there and I, I, I said, Matt, how are you doing? And I'll never forget his response here because it's an illustration of this. He said, Willie, I'm good. I'm trusting in the Lord. And I could have kind of stood there for a minute. And he said, he said I don't know anything else to do. There's nothing else. I, 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 it's a natural thing for, to trust in God. Why? Because he had been planted by streams of living water. And when, 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 when the heat came, he was okay because he trusted in God. And, and, and again, this is the picture right here. Uh, shall not see when he cometh, but her leaf shall be green and shall not be careful in the year of drought. In reality, you don't have to, this, this tree right here is, is basically because it's so close to, to living water uh, that it, when a drought is out, out there, it doesn't even recognize it. It's, it doesn't, it's not even having to be careful because it's still getting that same constant flow. And that's exactly what we can do. And as we counsel others, we need to constantly send people back to the word of God in this. So really, this is, this is, the, uh, this is the tree model and, and really kind of the, the picture of where we get it from. It is a simple illustration. You plant a tree by rivers of living water, good fruit will come. That really is the simple picture beside, behind what we are doing here. A couple things we need to understand, though. People respond to God in belief or unbelief. Um, that's what I was uh, mentioning last night. All sin is a sin of unbelief. Now, it's not that, that, you, that, I, that any of us necessarily would say, I don't believe that's true, because I think we actually would say, no, I, th I believe that, that God is good. Uh, I believe, and going back to my illustration, I'll bring it back a couple times here, and we'll walk through it with a tree here in just a minute. 
But uh, going back to my illustration as far as getting upset and angry because of something that was said. If you'd have come to me at that moment and said, Willie, you don't believe that, that, that God has everything in control. And, my, and my, my immediate response would be, yes, I do. I believe God is in control. But I wasn't actively playing that out. So that's why it is a sin of unbelief. I was not believing at that moment that God is who he says he is. And that's exactly what faith is. Faith is something that we have to, 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 to have uh, every, every day, every moment. And remember, faith is believing that God is who he says he is, even when it looks like he isn't. God is who he says he is, even when it looks like he isn't from, a, from an earthly standpoint. So people respond to God in belief or unbelief. A, believer, a believing response to God and his word is this. Number one, what God says is real and true, no matter what. If the Bible says it, it's true. Now, it's very important for us to understand context. We can't try to draw something out of Scripture. That's why it's, 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 it's so good that you're in a church that will, that will, that will make the, script, the Word of God clear. As you study Scripture, make sure you have it accurate because we, it's important for us to make sure that we're not ta- going down a tangent when, when, and, and thinking that something is true. In reality, it's not what the Bible says. But what God says, when we understand the Scriptures, what God says is real and is true. Uh, that is a believer's response to God and His Word. Secondly, a right, in right belief, okay? Again, we're going to overlay this with the tree here in just a minute. But right belief, which would be the root aspect of the tree, would be choosing to put God first, really, no matter what. Uh, that's the belief system. And then it plays out in right desires, okay? So the, so the, so the belief system is the roots of the tree, Right desires is really where we see the trunk. And that means letting God direct what, he, what I want. Uh, the things that we choose as our desires need to be things that God allows in our lives. And if we go down a path of, of a desire that is not something that's healthy, then, then all it's going to do is lead into wrong actions and wrong words. That's allowing God to work uh, through me. Okay, so... If I have right belief, then it'll come out in my desires. Belief plants desires, and desires come out in in the fruit of a tree. Um, Unbelieving response to God and His Word. What God says is is real and true. That's that's from the first one. This is the wrong belief, okay? Choosing to put myself first. This This is what I'm choosing to believe. Choosing to put myself first. It comes out in wrong desires. Following what my flesh wants. And then it's going to come out in wrong actions and words, letting my flesh really have control of me and rule me. Of course, there's some, there's some verses there that, that, that go right, right along with that. Um, so really, this is kind of the run through of what an incorrect belief or a correct belief would be and an incorrect belief uh, would be as we are looking at this picture of, of the tree. So we understand this and then people produce fruit that reflect a heart of belief or unbelief. Um, We can look at a couple of these. Galatians chapter 5. Of course, you recognize this this passage. Um, Let me just read these verses. Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 and following. I know we're moving through this pretty quickly, but I want to kind of walk through the tree and then see see what questions you might have. But uh, Galatians chapter 5, verse 19 and following, says, Now the works of the flesh... Are manifest. Okay, so these are the works of the flesh. These are the wrong types of fruit on a tree. Now, the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past. They, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. The people have this as the characteristic of their life and there is no remorse. Then they show no sign of knowing Christ. And in reality, because of their fruit, we can say those people probably don't know Christ. But, verse 22, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, 
Against such there is no law. Why? Because we are not under the law. We are under grace. So, as we're looking at this, this, this uh, picture of this tree, and if you want to turn there in your, in your books just to kind of get an understanding of it, you, we don't have page numbers on these, I don't believe, um, but just turn to that, that first one here where it's got all of the, the two different types of... Uh, this is why this can be confusing at times. When we first started doing this, we did, we did one tree that did all the bad fruit on one side and all the good fruit on the other side just to help us put it all in one picture. And that's what you see right here. Uh, it does help, and we'll explain this. There's individual trees a little bit later. Um, but you see what we're talking about uh, in, this, in, in what we've just mentioned already. Um, God's truth is down here, is where we are renewed. If you turn, okay, turn back one page to this one. You're going to see overlaid what we discussed last night as far as the put off, renew, and put on. So understand again, this picture that we are seeing here, it's a picture of a tree. What we see in our life is the evidence of either right thinking or wrong thinking, either right belief or wrong belief. And really all we're seeing is the evidence. So any sin that comes out, let's say anger comes out, okay? And God convicts us of being angry. Now we know anger is a sin. And so God comes and he, and he convicts us of being angry. We know that doesn't look like Christ. That can't be a part of my life. All right, so what are we gonna do at this point? This is why biblical counseling is vital because it walks us through a process of really digging out the, uh, the understanding of why I'm angry. So I can't just on a tree, okay? Let's say I have an orange tree, Okay. And, uh, you know, I like oranges, but now I'm tired of oranges. Now I want a banana tree, okay? Is there a banana tree? Is it a, is it a tree? I think so. Pineapple tree? Do they have pineapple trees? Um, uh, so I have an orange tree, and I want a banana tree. I can't just pluck all of the oranges off and tape bananas on an orange tree. Why? Because it's not a banana tree. It has to be completely changed. This is where you go too far, the analogy breaks down, okay? So we don't want to do this. So, so I have bad fruit. Suppose I have anger on my tree. And I know oh, the opposite of this is, is loving kindness, okay? So that's the fruit of the Spirit that I need to have. Well, I can't just say, okay, God convicted me of this anger. God, forgive me, which is the, the first steps. And then say, okay, God, help me to be loving kind. That's what, we, that's what I had done for years. And I say, God, forgive me. I know that's wrong. I know it doesn't look like, like you. And I need to be kind. God, help me to be kind. And that is part of it. But I really need to understand, and this is where the counseling aspect comes into it. I need to understand, what are my desires? What am I not getting that I think I should get uh, that's causing me to, to have this anger. And I can't just stop at the desires aspect of it either, of the trunk, of the tree. Because I can't just say, okay, I have a wrong desire. God, forgive me of this desire. I need to do it. No, I've got to, I've got to change my desires. So when you overlay the Ephesians 4 aspects of biblical change, which is put off, what's the second aspect? Renew. And put on. This is why biblical change is organic. I can't just say I don't want to be angry anymore, and I know I need to be a loving kindness. So I got to I got to work really hard at being kind. And so I go out and I do all kinds of kind things. And on the outside, it looks like wow, he's really changed. But I haven't changed because my heart hasn't changed. My heart has to change, and the only way I can change my heart is to change my desires. The only way to change my desires and my wants is to change what I'm finding satisfaction in, and that's changing my belief system. Um, there is a phrase uh, down at the bottom of this, this page right here. 
and I apologize, I don't have all of this on the screen. Um, this is what we're going to be doing. That's what I'm doing right now is integrating the tree model uh, with the pattern of biblical change, which is the put off, renew, and put on. So I'm going to go ahead. I just did that to wake you guys up. Just to change my animation there. Um, so we'll put this up there. Uh, and if it's in black at the very top, I couldn't figure out how to change that. So you see on this illustration, this, this is why I said it's going to be pretty interactive tonight. Uh, it's not going to be as cut and dry as, as it's been in the others. We just have to walk through this. But the up, up top where it says what's bad in the put off. So that's where we see the wrong fruit. That's where we see, let's say, anger. Okay. And you see the aspects of what has to happen. You see it here and you also see it one page back. You probably want to follow along here on this one. So you see what we talked about last night. Okay, when I put off, obviously I can only do this because I am a Christian, okay? Put off starts at salvation. It's the only possible possibility. But at that point, what do I need to do? I need to confess and forsake. And we talked about what that looks like last night. I need to ask for forgiveness of God and of man. I need to practically say, okay, what, what is gonna help me do the right thing? I need to radically remove from Matthew chapter five, if my right hand offends me, I need to cut it off. A lot of times in the past, I know I did this, that's where I stopped. I said, okay, I'm just gonna get rid of these things in my life and, and if I get these things out of my life, then, I can, then I'm doing what's, what's right. No, because I'm stopping at my desires. We've got to go farther and change our beliefs. On this page right here at the very bottom, this quote down here, it says this, and this kind of clarifies a little bit. I do what I do, which is the fruit on the tree. Do what I do and say what I say, that's the fruit, because I want what I want. That's the desires. I want what I want because I believe what I believe about God, his word, and myself. So do you see how this how this all comes from the roots of unbelief. I'm not believing what is true about God. And, that's, and, and when I have anger in my heart, that's exactly what happens. So what do I have to do? I have to change what I, what I think is accurate about God. The only way I can do that is by being deep in God's word. And the more I am in God's word, the more I will understand who he is. And then in an organic way, it changes my desires. Go back to this, this tree right here. It changes my desires to line up with God's desires naturally, not in a forced way. And in an organic way, I have good fruit. Again, that's why, that's why the Bible says this is a fruit of the spirit. Paul, Paul said it much more simply. It's just that I think we've gotten so confused by things, we have to break it down and really understand. The fruit of the Spirit, it is, it is fruit that comes from the Spirit. The Holy Spirit uses God's words to change us and change our desires. So let me, uh, let me walk through this with, well, let me say this. When you're counseling let me, walk, let, me, let me explain a couple things in this book and then I'm going to walk through an illustration from my own heart, okay? Um, when we're counseling, asking questions is a key and asking intentional questions is a key. And this, this page right here where it says the questions that draw out the heart Really, there's questions that you can ask that really help you understand really what's going on, what they are desiring, what they are trying to find satisfaction in. And so these are some of those questions that, that, that you can utilize in this. And again, it's questions that draw out the heart, not push out the heart. You're not trying to make somebody say something. You, you want them to really give you what they're thinking so you can help them where they're hurting and where the issue is. So that's the questions that draw out the heart. Um, at the very back of here, and we'll, and we'll utilize this, um, in the very back, there are 
or two pages of it says God is. These are truths of who God is that when the Holy Spirit grasps our heart about these truths and he enlightens us to who God is, this is just specific passages of who God is that help us to think rightly, okay? Now, I know this can be confusing, okay? I understand. It was when I was a counselor, it took me three years before I really started grasping. I think this one's easier because it has individualized trees. What are... What are some questions you might have at this point right now? That you're like, okay, I'm not getting this because I, I, I really want to kind of help us understand this if, if we don't get it. Yes, ma'am. Mm-hmm. Pushing, I am trying, and the idea of pushing out the heart is I'm trying, I, this is what I think you think, this is what I think you might be having a problem with. Uh, you're angry, so I think this might be it. So I'm going to, ask leading questions that kind of push you in a direction. And that's not helpful. I could be accurate, but it's not helpful in the counseling process because I want to, if I really want to help them, I need to really know what they're thinking. So I ask questions that aren't leading, that more draw out the truth about their heart. Does that make a great question? Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, here's the question. He's asking if this is something that we just have the, like, like a, something that's running in the background, like an operating system. Is that your question? Uh, that that kind of guides them in their thinking? Yes and no. It's both. Now, there might be smaller conversations that it's just in the back of the head, and I know that I'm trying to work, but I will take, and this is why in this, in this book, you'll notice there's blank trees in the very back that for our counselors or operational staff, whoever's going to be counseling, we, you hear our counselors throughout the course of the summer saying, I'm going to go tree myself because I don't think I'm thinking right. So they will go and they'll walk through the process of this to really try to figure it out. So when I'm counseling somebody, there are times when I will just think about it and I will, I will guide them through the process of putting off, renewing and putting on. But there are also times when I will get this out and I will say, okay, let's, let me show you something. The reason I do that sometimes is because I know where I'm going, but if it's a camper that has no idea what the tree is, I would have to explain the tree completely and then, and then uh, you know, kind of try to walk them through it at that point. And then, I'm, then I'm, I don't want to confuse them more. So it's both, really. And... See, this is, is wonderful. I will, I will do this with my kids. I will do this with me. Now, I might not get out a tree every time. I'm like, okay, let's get out a tree and figure out why I just was, was a moron to my kids. Um, I, I, I don't necessarily do that. Um, however, I think it's a very profitable thing. And in a long-term counseling situation, I absolutely would do this. I would absolutely do this because then I would send it home and say, okay, I want you to work through this, come back. Homework, by the way, and in counseling, and I know that sounds academic, um, but homework is, is a very important part of a counseling process. If you, can, if you walk through something and, you, and then you send them back with something, say, okay, take this and work through this for the next you know, week, and we'll, you know, let's meet again next Friday. I'll, I'll meet you for lunch, and, and we'll walk, but, but do this for the next four days, and, and, and homework is a pretty, pretty important part, and there's a lot of good depending on what you might be dealing with, there's a lot of good material out there to, to guide them in, in, in homework to do. So where was I? Oh, any other questions? Good. I don't want to confuse you. I don't want to confuse you. I know I can. What do you mean by self-discovery? You're talking about somebody who I might be counseling? Okay. Um, 
see if I'm getting this. Really, the importance of them to understand why they don't stop at a certain aspect of it. Is that what you're saying? Like why, why they're needing to get down to the root? Is that what you're asking? Um, really, the purpose to getting down to the root is because it's gonna be a superficial change if you don't get down to the very source of the issue. If I don't, as we talked about last night, if I don't really recognize why I'm sinning, I, number one, I could be incorrect, but it could be, again, just a superficial thing. Okay, I know this is sin, and I'm convicted about this. And I don't want this. Okay, did you ask God to forgive you? Yes. Okay, well, if you, if you asked him to help you, yes. Okay, well, then, then, then go on and, and try to do better. As opposed to, all right, you have a tendency to do this? You, you, are you known as an angry person? Uh, to use that, continue that illustration. Are you known as an angry person? Yeah, I am. All right, listen, there's a reason you're angry. Let's talk about why you're angry. Let's talk about what makes you angry. And then we, then we go into the questions that really draw out the heart. When was the last time you got angry? Tell me about that. Walk me through that process and, and really some enlightening things will come out. And it's very helpful to have something to write down, to take notes when you're, when you're walking through and helping somebody with, with, with an issue. Um, again, it looks academic, but it's helpful. Uh, and, and so hopefully that'll, that'll help. Does that answer that question a little bit? Hope, and I think it might, it might clarify a little bit more as we walk through. Okay, I'm gonna go back to questions here again in just a minute, but let me walk through my scenario uh, and how God renewed my heart and brought good fruit out by his grace, okay? So, because remember, grace is the key. Grace is the key. Believing truth and understanding grace. Um, so I told you, I told you uh, there was a meeting that was had and somebody said something in that meeting and uh, I was angry. Now, I could have been like, oh Lord, I got angry again. Forgive me, I'm sorry, help me to not do that again, okay? And there are times when I still do that and I, because I'm, not, I'm being too lazy to work through the process. But I started thinking, okay, wait a second, Willie. Okay, why was I angry? So I'm counseling myself here, okay? So it's easier to, to give an illustration this way. It's hard to do a, a, a scenario because you don't know, you're making stuff up. It's easier because I know both sides here, okay? So I'm, that's why I'm using counseling myself. So I'm thinking, okay, why did I get angry? And I started thinking, well, somebody said something about me. And then I started going down the, down the road of, they, didn't, they shouldn't have said, they should have asked me about this. And I'm going down farther down this road and it's getting me more and more agitated. And I'm saying, wait a second, stop, get back. Why am I, why am I still getting angry? Well, they said something about me. So I, now I'm understanding and, and I didn't like it. So what's my satisfaction here? What would I have been satisfied with? I would have been satisfied, okay, in, 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 in a couple ways. If I, I could have been, I, and what I mean by satisfaction at this point, I would not have sinned if a couple of things would have happened, okay? What, what would have been those couple of things? Anything? anything? Yeah, well, I, I wouldn't have sinned, what? If they hadn't have said what they said, okay? If they hadn't have said what they said, I would not have gotten angry, right? Yeah. Okay, yeah, if they'd have come back later and they'd admit it, you know, I didn't, that, then I wouldn't have gotten angry, right? Okay, but now we're seeing, I'm not, I still have a problem here, right? This is still a surface, Jeff. Yeah, I'm blaming him, okay? And so, so if, I can, if I can deflect too, that would probably help me. So all of these things, I, I know what's going on in my heart, right? And I wouldn't have sinned had these things happened. But what's the problem? They did happen. And they could happen again. That could happen every day for the rest of my life. So what am I going to do? Either depend on somebody not doing something so I don't sin, or I can dig down deep and understand the problem. And this is how God started working in me. I was, I was studying in Hebrews chapter 13, okay? So now I understand, okay? So let's just walk through here. 
I see my sin and I knew it was sin. I was convicted about it. And I started breaking it down and I started to see what I was relying on to make me content, make me happy. If somebody else wouldn't have said that, I would have been happy had it not been said. I would have been happy had it been accurate. I would have been happier if they had said something really good about me and it made me look really good. But I'm seeing my desires. It's all, it's, it's all here. So I'm like, okay, wait a second. This stuff did happen. So what am I going to do? I was in Hebrews chapter 13, and I was just studying through it. No, no real rhyme or reason. It was, just, it was in my personal time in the Word. And this is what God does, okay? And I was out jogging. And again, don't get sidetracked um, by, that, by that fact. But I was out jogging, and I could take you. I, I, will, I could take you to the very spot where God just you've been illumined to truth before. I, I've read Hebrews 13 and umpteen billions of times, okay? But God illumined this truth to my heart. The Holy Spirit did this because I'm, 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 I'm running and I round this corner and I'm, I'm up to this corner. I am just angry. Man, I wish they hadn't said that. that was, if they had just, and, and over and over again, my heart is just getting agitated and agitated, angry and angry, angrier. And, and all of a sudden I'm like, Willie, stop. And then I, the Lord took me back to Hebrews chapter 13 and, and I started meditating and thinking. And now I'm down to the renewing my heart. See, right now my belief system is wrong. I, I have not gotten to the point in my, in my belief system that I am actively believing that God has this in control. So God takes me to his word. The Holy Spirit takes me to Hebrews chapter 13 where it says, be content with such things as ye have. Okay, I'm like, okay. And I'm sitting here jogging. I'm thinking, okay, I am not content, Lord. I understand that. Forgive me. But he didn't stop there. Be content with such things as you have. Why? What's the rest of that passage? Be content with such things as you have. Why? For I have said, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. And I had been studying this and I knew that was a double negative in that passage. A double negative in the English is a positive, but the double negative in the Greek is an emphasis. And I had studied that out just in my time in the word and I knew what it meant. And God is saying, Willie, you need to be content because you have me that's all you need. And the double negative is basically he's saying, I will never, ever, 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 ever leave you. I will never, ever, ever, ever forsake you. So be content with such things as you have and basically saying what you have or what you don't have because I will never leave you. You have me and that is all you need. So God the power of the Holy Spirit is now making me think truth about him. And I started specifically applying and saying, okay, Lord, number one, forgive me again. And I know that you have, you have said, I need you. I don't need anything else. And I started running it down a trail of, God, you could have changed anything in that meeting that you wanted to. You could have made that meeting not even happen. You could have made it so I could have walked into that when that was being said and I could have refuted everything. You could have changed whatever you wanted to change. Now I'm starting to believe the truth that God is all powerful and God is strong. So God, you could have done that. You chose not to. So I just need to rest in that. My heart flipped. And guess what? Now I'm renewing my mind about my improper belief and what's coming out. I don't need to know what they say in those meetings. God has it all in control. My desires are changing. My satisfaction is changing. And you know what started coming out on my tree? Contentment. In a supernatural way, and my heart was changing. Now, was I over that for the rest of my life? I wasn't. 
I battled that for the next few weeks. But you know what I did? Now I knew the path. Now I knew what was going on in my heart. Now I knew that when I thought those, 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 those wrong thoughts of, why would they say that? Why would that all, why? when I thought those thoughts, my, my heart, when I was thinking rightly, and eventually every single time I got there, my heart flipped. Be content with such things as you have. God, you could have changed whatever you wanted to. You, I have you, that's all I need. I don't need the, 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 the recommendation of man. I don't need to be looking right in, in, the, in the eyes of anybody. I don't need that. God, you have it all in control and you could change whatever you want. You chose not to. I'm content. And I started finding my desires changing. I started seeing my fruit change to contentment. And then as I continued to work through that process, the times of my struggle got farther and farther apart to where now, now I use it as an illustration. I don't even care. Because I don't care. I don't. And I have had other situations. Now, is it true that, I, that I, don't, I don't always not care about what people say? No, I already told you I was defensive and I'm working through that. Again, just in the exact same way. But I'm finding my moments of, of deep struggle in this to continue to change. Is, is that a little clear? Okay. So with this tree model, and basically what I've done is I've just treed myself uh, without going to it and saying, okay, but I've looked at the put off and the renew and the put on, but I know, I know that, that there are things, there are things on the altar of my heart that can't be there. And I've got to make sure those, I got to understand why they're there. And then I get down to the truth about God. When, I, when God starts teaching me who he is, I change. That's why it's vital for us to be deep in scripture. That's, what, that's why it's vital for us to use God's word, not my thoughts. I have a tendency sometimes when I'm, when I'm counseling a situation, I will take people down Willie's principles. And then, and then I know it's, I'm like, why are they not getting this? And I'm like, wait a second. No, okay. I got it. Okay. Let's, let's talk scripture. Um, for instance, if somebody is, is struggling with anxiety, I, I, will, I will walk, time out just one second, okay? Let me say this too. There are times when, as you're dealing with some, some more intense things, addictions, depression, it is helpful to go have them go see a doctor, okay? Because there could be some physical things that are attributed to not thinking rightly, Okay? But our role is to constantly be pushing him back to Bible because we can always think Bible. Okay, so it is helpful. So I just want to kind of put that aside thought. But suppose somebody is struggling with anxiety and this is getting more and more prevalent and they're having panic attacks or whatever. I might walk them down a few thoughts about, you know, what, what's going on in, with a panic attack or anxiety or anything like that. But you know what I, I do very quickly? I take them to Matthew chapter six and I just start reading through. Actually, let me do that real quick because I think this will be helpful as, as far as seeing how, because it is, the, it is the word of God that is powerful. God's word is, is, is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. God's word pierces to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and is a, God's word is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of our hearts. It's God's word that is powerful, not Willie's thoughts. So let's be quick to go to God's word. And I want to challenge, don't just necessarily read through the passage, think through the passage with them. Walk them through it. So I go to Matthew chapter six, and somebody's dealing with, as I'm dealing with, with anxiety, and, uh, I've got to find it now. Okay, it's 25, yeah. It says, therefore I say unto you, take, take no thought of your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body what you shall put on. 
Is not life more than meat and the body more than raiment? Then, then you use the illustration that God uses. All right, think about the birds. Behold the fowls of the air. They sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns. And I stop and i like, okay, have you ever seen a worried bird? I have never seen a worried bird. I've never seen a, 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 we have a bird feeder outside my house. It's my 14-year-old son's job to, to, to feed that bird feeder. I have never seen, and he forgets sometimes. And I've never seen a bird come up to the door and be like, uh, excuse me, your son forgot to feed the, uh, feed the bird feeder and uh, put, put, put feed in the bird feeder and uh, we're going to starve. And my, I've never seen that. Yet your heavenly father feedeth them. And then I, I will stop and I will say, look at my eyes. Are you no, not much more important than they? Don't you think God cares about you way more than he cares about these birds? He will take care of you. Because he loves you. And then, but he's not done. He goes on and he says, which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? Why take ye thought for raiment? Don't worry about if God's going to take care of you. What does he say? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. You don't see one of these lilies of the field out there just like, oh, what am I going to wear today? And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast of the oven, shall he not much more clothe you? And then it goes back to faith. You're not believing God is who he says he is. Don't you think that was probably way more impacting because of the power of the Holy Spirit? Then Willie's saying, oh, you really need to stop worrying. The word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. The word of God is that. So go to God's word quickly, because that is what changes their hearts, changes their beliefs, and gives them an all-new belief system in the renewing of the, pro, of the mind. And then they start to start making choices to say, okay, I'm going to believe God. And it's not just saying, okay, I'm going to work really hard to believe God. God organically does this. He teaches them this from his word. It is a, as pastor said earlier, it is a supernatural thing. I can't explain it. You can't explain it. Only God can. I'm thankful he does it. So what's my role in this? Take him to God's word quickly. And God will start changing their heart and good fruit will come out. Now, it might be a longer process. And obviously there are more delicate, more, more, more sensitive things that have to be kind of worked through. And, and, and that's why it's so important to have the pastors going to the pastors to say, okay, how can you help me? If maybe if you're dealing with somebody else who's going through something that's, that's scary or very sensitive or, or, or going to get some help on counseling, it's, it's a very important thing. We need to learn to trust God in every aspect of our life. And we need to help others learn to trust God. You only trust somebody you know. I'll illustrate it this way, then we'll be done. Or I'll ask, see if you have any couple questions. Um, we have a zip line at the wilds. It is about 600 feet long. It's over two of our waterfalls. It's about 330 feet off the ground. So it's over, the second zip is over Fourth Falls, which is 127 feet. And we're talking 300. So we're, we're looking down about 500 feet. If you fall, you die. When we were getting trained on the zip line a few years ago, we just put it in and the people came in, they were training us. They came in and they said, okay, put your harness on. I was like, what? you put my harness on. And they're like, no, you put your harness on. So we actually had to put our own harnesses on. And then they took us up there and they said, okay, hook yourselves on the line. I was like, no, you hook me on the line. I don't want to die. 
So we had to hook ourselves on the line. And I promise you for the first, we were out there for two straight days doing this. And I promise you for the first number of times we were doing this, we were, I was looking at every single person I could look at. Could you look at my heart? Does it make, what do you think? Is, do you think this looks like, do you think? Because honestly, if I fall, I die. We would hook ourselves on the line and I was going, <laughs> I was doing that over and over and over again. Cause I, cause if you fall, you die. It was very unnerving. Why? I had never done this before. I had never experienced the zip line before. I didn't know what it was, it was going to hold me. I didn't know anything about it. We we're out there for two days. Now I've been doing the zip line. I run the zip line now for a number of years. And you know what? When we go out now, we're goofing off the whole time. We're throwing our harness. Probably not the best thing. But we're, we're throwing our harness on. We're goofing off the whole time. We're hooking ourselves on the line. Zing, we're going across. What changed? The zip didn't change. My understanding of the zip changed. I know now because I have experienced it so much. I know the zip. I know it's going to hold me. Last year, they went out and they made some adjustments on the cable and stuff. And I knew that they had made some adjustments on the cable. And we went out again to do our yearly training. And guess what was happening again? Hey, does this look all right? Can you check, can you check this? I was doing that over and over again. Why? Because I knew something had changed. The only re reason I would ever be nervous about doing the zip line is if I thought something changed. God never changes. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And as we get to know God, he changes us. And I don't ever have to worry about, uh, did he change his mind? No. There is a consistency in God that we can't even fathom. And that's why it's so, it's so vital for when we're counseling others, when we're counseling ourselves, we get to God's word, we understand God's word, and then God changes us. And then I don't have to worry about it later. I go back to the exact same truth. I go back to the truth. I don't have to adjust something. I'm like, that didn't seem to be working. I'm going to have to do something else. No, I just intensify what I, what I know to be right. Does that, does that make sense? I hope so. So in the process of biblical change, again, we take a week for our counseling staff to walk through this. So doing it in about an hour, is, <laughs> I understand there could be like, what about this? What about this? I understand that. I think if you think through it through that, with that book, I think it will be more and more clear if you choose to use this model. Um, but again, put off, renew, put on is the basic thrust of the whole thing. And as you're looking at the picture, okay, there's bad fruit up there. I don't want that bad fruit. I know I've been convicted. That bad fruit doesn't look like Christ. I need to get rid of it. Well, I can't just pull it off and tape some good fruit on. No, it, there's a process that teaches me to change. I have to understand why in the desires of my heart, in my wants, in my satisfactions, I have to understand why I'm doing this because then it will lead me to understanding what I'm not thinking rightly about, what belief I'm not believing in. And that kind of helps in, that, in the back of that book when we're talking about the truths of who God is. And those right there also are, the, are where you go to say, okay, I'm not believing this about God. Well, this is what the Bible says is true about God. So I go there and I study those passages and the Holy Spirit takes those passages, illuminates them to my heart. And then he starts to, in an organic way, push out right belief, which puts out right desires. And eventually there's, there's proper fruit there. Okay. There's the process. But it's so important for us, as we talked about the first three sessions, to understand how we think about life, understanding that it is a process of endurance. And it's a process of understanding that God allows things to come into our lives to teach us to think rightly about life. We have to understand grace. And I'm telling you, I get up, and, and most every morning that I get up, I, I, I plead to God, I say, God, you know, you know that I, I will go my own way today. I desperately need your grace. And part of tapping into God's grace is just by getting up and spending time in God's word, showing a dependent heart. That's humility. And God says, okay, I see that. Grace, grace. And I take certain steps of obedience, my little bitty steps, and God says, here's more grace. Here's more grace because we're sending about grace blowed away. So I understand grace because then all that flows out because I am a Christian. I don't have to sin. I need to know that. And I understand that. 
And then all those truths kind of wrap themselves around and, and then I can start counseling my own heart and I can change to be more like Christ, to what pleases him. Not because I'm working really, really hard at it, although I am working. That's what Philippians 2.12 says, working out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. So that's the process. Any questions? <laughs> Any questions? Good question. Um, it, it helps me to think in the right way. Okay, she asked what I mean by organic. Natural. It's not artificial. Um, I know you think of organic food, you're like, oh, that's healthy. That's not what I'm talking about here. I'm talking about just, just the way a tree grows. Uh, it, it doesn't, I can't just take a tree, put it in my, in, my, in my living room and say, okay, it's got oranges, but tomorrow I want bananas. No, it's got, it's got to be, the only way it can actually have banana trees is if it's a real banana and it's naturally doing what a tree natural, a banana tree naturally does. That's the only thing I mean by organic. Does that clarify? Does that make sense? It's not because it's healthy necessarily. It's because it's, it's just natural uh, in the way that, that, that good fruit flows out. It's a natural process because I'm thinking rightly, I'm going to have good fruit. I'm thinking poorly, wrongly, I'm going to have bad fruit. So that's what I mean by organic. Any other questions? Yes, sir. In that process? Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's, he's suggesting that God ordained might be a, a good way to, to say this. Um, what's that? That wasn't your question. That was just a statement there. Suggestion. Interacting. Do you have a question? He didn't know I was angry. <laughs> and honestly, I don't even know who said it. So the, in, the, in the forgiveness aspect, uh, something was said and I heard it was said and I never, I never offended anybody else. And so I'm dealing with it with me and God at that point. Yeah. Oh, that's true. Well, I don't know who it was. <laughs> I'm gonna have to think about it. No, that is true. Yeah, I totally agree with you. And if for if anybody came to me and said, "Hey, you remember that one time I said that?" I don't know that I was true. I'd be like, "You did that? Thank you." I would actually probably do that. Absolutely would. And then I'd kind of walk them through how that how God worked that out. God doesn't make mistakes. He did it on. God did it. God allowed that in my heart. I'm not saying he put it there because it was a temptation necessarily, but God allowed that. God didn't make a mistake. So thank you, Jeff. It was good. Anything else real quick? I know we're a little bit over time. I apologize for that. So, Okay, well, thank you so much. Uh, and I, I, I appreciate your, your, your welcoming me here. I, I very much appreciate uh, everything you guys have done for me. You've been a blessing to me, and I want you to know that. So thank you. Let's stand together. We'll close in prayer. Uh, Make sure you keep the books. I think this really is going to have some opportunity for you to have some conversation with one another as you talk through how to work through things with one another. As you go from that that surface sin issue to the heart sin issue down into the unbelief issue, you know, down into the things I'm believing I shouldn't to the things that I should be believing that I'm not, right back up to that all that process, I was thinking of this. We had a tree in our backyard when I was a kid. It was an olive tree, and it used to get all these, these suckers, you know, around the bottom. You could cut down the tree, and then you'd still have a bush. And it's kind of better than what it was, but you still have the bush, and you have to trim back the bush. And, you keep, and that's the way some of us deal with sin in our lives. We just keep trimming back the bush rather than rooting out the sin. And so... 
let's, let's be transformed by the renewing of our minds. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you for the truth that is here and the transforming work. Lord, I thank you for the peace that it brings to our hearts. Lord, the, what a miracle it seems to be when someone says something harsh or unkind or, or sinful to us and it doesn't matter because we've been free from the selfishness or the anger or the arrogance or whatever it is that is in the depths of our hearts. And what a joy it is to, when we realize that you did that. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless.